happy. Okay, so we're gonna do one last thing. So remember we're talking about evolution. Okay, I can start with showing you pretty pictures just to warm you up. Uh, we were talking about we're talking about evolution of bacteria yesterday. Remember the long-term evolution experiment. Uh, so you can do the same thing on yeast. This is just a summary table of what people do in lab evolution. So we were mainly talking about this and climbing up uh, the landscape, starting from some initial individual who tries to mutate and do that. Uh, so you can do something similar with just DNA, mRNA, or just proteins, some molecule. You generate a random library of different mutants, and so they fall in different places on this rugged landscape, and then you select them for, say, binding to something, like a protein, whether it's a good enzyme, and the ones that are left behind are left behind, and as time goes on, you find the winner. You find the one that lies here, on this landscape. You can also do these kinds of in-lab experiments with breeding, so with mating. Yeast do mate in general. Uh, in the lab, they don't like to mate, okay? It's kind of like animals in the zoo. Um, so what they do is they mate them beforehand in happy conditions, and then they usually what happens is it turns into uh, more of evolution like that. And flies, on the other hand, if they want to reproduce, they have to mate. So people are now starting to do these kinds of uh, experiments also with flies. Flies are difficult because they fly, okay? And so, uh, you know, this is actually a problem. So already with E. coli and yeast, you have a problem with contamination. How do you make sure that something from this dish didn't somehow come into the other? Now imagine that this thing flies and tries to get from one test tube where it's supposed to be breeding with your controlled population to another one. So these are very hard experiments to do, and of course flies also reproduce much more slowly, so it takes more time. But just so that you know that people are doing things like that, and this is what you get as a result of these experiments. So for the in vitro ones, as I said, you really select for a winner. This is like picking the best protein out of a randomly generated library. So at the end, so you start off with a lot of diversity, and at the end of the day, you get one winner. In asexual organisms, you get these patterns of what we talked about yesterday, clonal interference, where somebody wins for a while, then somebody else that's better comes along, and so on and so on. And this goes on, and you're generally getting more diversity end of the, at the end of the day than you started off with. Uh, in yeast, the time scale here is shorter, so it's going to up until here, there. You start off with large diversity because you outbred them, you, you made them made in the beginning, and then on short time scales, there's one that will win before the process starts looking like that. And this is just flies where, of course, they mate, so they extend chromosomes get mixed up. That's what mating is. So you start off with specific chromosomes, and then you get these mosaic patterns, which is what happens uh, in real life. So this is just to tell you that these kinds of things happens, happen. But uh, let us now think, go back to what we were talking about, and as you say, you see in a lot of these cases you get this fixation phenomenon. So somebody wins. So yesterday we derived this equation that I will just write back. This is the equation with selection uh, and mutations. Sorry, two. Um, so we have the mutations. And then genetic drift. So I think it looks like this. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to ask a question about fixation, and we're going to say, given that our population is initially at time zero, um, it, that uh, there's some initial condition that 
we have, well, one individual of the new mutant, uh, what's the probability that this mutant will fix? Okay, so at time zero, you have one individual out of n. And so we want to solve this equation. So of course, we could go ahead and solve this equation, um, right? So we're after the question of what's the fixation probability. But that's rather difficult. There's an easier way of doing it, okay? So physically, what is fixation? Grow. So remember we were drawing these, right? This is the steady state probability. And fixation is when you get to one, okay? And the extinction is when you get to zero. They're symmetric, right? So maybe extinction is easier. Uh, in terms of boundary conditions, can, does that look from, if I say boundary conditions, does that look like anything? Both of these are absorbing boundary conditions, right? Once you get to one of these, you don't leave. So how do we solve these kinds of problems? If I ask, if I'm telling you I start off with this frequency and what's the probability of me getting here? What kind of problem is this in physics? First passage time, yes. So we're going to solve it as a first passage time problem and how do we solve first passage time problems? What kind of equation? This is a forward equation and we solve by the backward equation, right? So we're gonna write down the backward equation. Everybody's seen a backward equation in their life, right? Okay, if you didn't, this, you will see one now. Uh, uh, but, uh, so okay, so the general idea of backward equations, I'll write it down and then I'll explain it. May, I'm sure you've seen it, you may not recognize the word backward. If you've been overly tainted by mathematicians, you'd want to call it Kolmogorov something. Okay, so this is an equation for P of X, Y given T, where X is the frequency uh, at time t, which is the end of the interval, uh, given, uh, what is it, uh, that y is the frequency at time t0, at the initial time, okay? So we know, it's called the backward equation because we know what we want x to be. We want x, uh, we want it to fixate and we want it to be one. But we're going to ask, um, we, it's an equation for y and we're going to solve it for depending on what y is, what is the probability that you get to x equals y, okay? That's why it's backward. We're, we're, asking, we're writing an equation for the initial condition instead of the final condition. A normal equation, you're given an initial condition and you're asked what's the prob frequency at the end. Now I'm gonna tell you, I know what my frequency at the end is, what is the initial, what's the probability of getting there given my initial condition. This is the adjoint equation to the forward equation, and this is how you derive it. And we're not gonna, do, I'm not gonna prove that, so okay, if I tell you it's the adjoint, this form should be obvious to you. You write this in matrix form and you take the adjoint of the matrix. So that's why these things come out of the derivative and that's why the sign changes here. This is like a momentum operator in quantum mechanics. Right, it's the first derivative, the adjoint of the first derivative gives you a minus sign. I, I'm giving you analogies, right? I'm waving my hands because in principle you should have seen it. 
but if you haven't, that, that, that's where this comes from, okay? If you want to, you can write this out as a matrix and take the adjoint and you will, I guarantee you, this is what it'll look like. Okay, so specifically, we are going to solve it. So we're actually going to solve for the extinction and then say that the fixation uh, is one minus, the probability of fixation is one minus extinction in the approximation that you're in this limit where you either go extinct or you don't. So we're going to say we want x equals zero, so extinction. If you want a title for, yeah, okay. Fixation probability is what we're after. Uh, and so that means that we want p of x equals zero y of t, and I'm going to shortcut my notation and just call it p y zero t. Okay, so rewriting this equation, maybe I don't need to rewrite this equation. Um, okay, let me just rewrite it for, for the sake of being general. So I, I'm just rewriting what you had. Okay, I'm even going to drop the zero because I'm going to drop the zero I feel from when I write. Okay, and we're going to look at the long time limit. Uh, we're going to look at t goes to infinity. So we're going to ask what's the probability of extinction at long times, which is essentially we're asking what's the probability of it going extinct at all. Okay, so we're solving the steady state form of this equation. And now this becomes easy. I can define an auxiliary function, which is just the derivative of d pi ui dy. Okay, for those of you that are bothered by, I'll try and keep my capitals and non-capitals the same. So if I define the py dy, um, well, first of all, if I have a zero here, I can get rid of these. So then I have, from the second one, I just have dr, whoops, I'm sorry. This is dy, of course. Yeah. Okay, so I have dr dy equals n s with a minus sign r of y, which is just an exponential equation, right? Everybody agrees? This is solved by an exponential? Good. So r of y equals zero. Okay, so now we have to unsolve that. So p of y dy equals, so it's, this is r at uh, y equals zero. I'm just gonna call it r zero e to the minus s y. Um, so I can do this by direct integration of the two sides. Get minus R naught NS E to the minus NS minus one. And on this side, I get P of Y minus P of Y equals zero. equals to that. Nothing interesting happened, but now we know that P of Y equals zero is equal to one. Because if P of Y is the probability of going 
uh, basically I'm asking now the question, what's the probability that I end up at zero given that I started at zero? Right? So if I'm already there and it's an absorbing boundary, I won't move. So this is one. So that means that P of Y is 1 plus a 0 ns. Uh, one, sorry, I missed the sign here. And that's why negative. All my signs are okay. Okay. Uh, and then I happen to know another thing that P of zero of Y equals one is zero. Because if I start off fixed, so if I start off in one, again, another boundary condition, I'll never get to zero, right? This is the probability of getting to zero. If I start off in the other sticky side, I'll never get to one, okay? So that's zero. So that gives me a way of calculating R naught, which is one plus R naught and S. Um, and S, right? So this means that a node over N S minus one minus. So if I put all of this together, then the probability I can put the is one minus one minus E N S Y one minus E N. And so since this was the probability of extinction, and I'm interested in the probability of fixation, and as I said, I'm, gonna, I'm working in this uh, limit of weak mutation, uh, yeah, essentially of weak mutation that I just look at the case so I should say that mutation is much less than one. I'm considering a case where I just had one mutation and there'll be no other mutation before this process manages to, to go through, right? Uh, so the idea is that basically all of the probability is either here or here. So I can approximate the probability of fixation as one minus the probability of extinction. So that means that the probability of fixation is this. New mu much less to one. Okay, because I can write it T fix is a pro one minus p. Okay. Sorry? Say it Where does the time factor in here? Because if you give enough time, the system will go to either or one of the yeah. points. But what's the typical time it takes? That's a very good question and that's what we'll do in the second part of this of today. You're nearly as if I paid you, you know. But in order to do that, we need the answer from, from this. So this is, you know, just be clear about the approximations. There's clearly this approximation and it's, yeah, nothing interesting happened in the time that it takes for this to happen. You can calculate the time for fixation too, but uh, we won't, we, from this formalism, we won't, we won't do that. Okay, so we'll start off by analyzing what this gives us. Okay, so the first limit, let's look at the limit that selection is strong. So in this limit, P fixation, which is given on that board over there, 
so I'm going to expand in the limit of ns large. Uh, so basically, I can delete whatever, you know, the, in the, the denominator, the one will dominate. And I'm left with e to the minus ny. And if we say now that y is 1 over n, so initially we have one individual. At the time we're looking at, then that means that this p fixation becomes 1 minus e to the minus s, which, again, for strong s, I can expand as 1 minus 1 minus s, and so this is equal to s, okay? So this has a name. It's called the Haldane result, that the probability of fixation is proportional to the, uh, to the selection. Uh, uh, for a beneficial mutation starting from one individual. Okay, if we start from K individuals, which essentially means we start looking at it when the K individuals, which is often what happens in experiments, because before that we may not see them, we may not be able to detect them. Well, then we have the probability of fixation to be 1 minus sk. And there's a threshold here uh, because it equals 1 if k is 1 over s, and it equals roughly ks if k is less than 1 over s. OK? So that tells you that there's a threshold at 1 over s above which, if you see an individual, so if you see them in k individuals, uh, where k is larger than the selection, one over the selection coefficient, that's almost certainly going to fix. Well, certainly going to fix. However, if you see less individuals than one over s, well, they still may fix, but the, the fate is much less likely. Okay, so that's case one. Okay, but th this is a result to remember that generally, if selection is strong, then the probability of fixation of a beneficial mutation is proportional to the selection strength. However, if selection is weak, and this can be either beneficial, so this is beneficial because it assumes it's a beneficial mutation, so it's a mutation that's good for you because it assumes that this is positive. Okay, we're going to do the negative one in a sec. Okay, so this is either a deleterious or a beneficial one, but with a weak selection coefficient. So this is the general result. And then we expand in the limits. And we get that it's proportional to y. So now, if selection is weak, the probability of fixation doesn't depend on the selection strength. It actually just depends on how many individuals you had in the beginning. So really, it that, so what's interesting here is that whether you're in a whether you're a your beneficial or a deleterious mutation, so your mutation that's good or bad for you, your probability of fixation is completely the same, right? It just depends on how many of you are there at the beginning. So if I now ask you this question in a different way, can a deleterious mutation fix? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. With a certain probability, but this tells you yes. It tells you it's not impossible. So just because you see a mutation somewhere, and like all of us, 
we can all have some deleter the same deleterious mutation. Okay, and all the yeast in the petri dish can get a deleterious mutation which can spread and just by chance. So it's not impossible for bad things to happen and survive. And it's even stronger than that because you can imagine having strong deleterious mutations. Okay, so this is deleterious, which means bad. Okay. <laughs> Beneficial means good. Deleterious means bad. Okay, so in this limit, we do the same game and we expand and we find a certain probability, which is arguably less pretty, but is an exponentially decaying probability with the selection coefficient, okay? Now remember that this is this, uh, uh, you know, so, okay, so you can say that, so first of all, again, the answer is even a very bad deleterious mutation can fix. It decays exponentially with the strength of how bad it is, but it can still fix. Uh, and so, okay, so basically this is exponentially small. So it, it is small, P fix. I write it here, but you know what I'm saying. It's exponentially small. Um, unless, one minus y is much smaller than one over s, okay? So unless you're already very close to winning, you're probably, as a very bad deleterious mutation, you are going to go extinct, but still this is probability, so anything can happen and you may actually fix. So let's draw this. The probability of fixation as a function of the selection coefficient. Starting with 1 over n between minus 1 over s and 1 over s. You basically have, if you start with 1 over n individual, so one individual in your population, you have a constant probability of fixation relative of whether you're good or bad. Here you have an exponentially decaying probability of fixation. Here is 1, where you're certain to fix, and in this intermediate regime. This is for, again, n mu, it's less than one. Okay. Ah, uh, da da. So, to connect this again to, to experiments, uh, there was a, a pretty nice experiment from another guy who got annoyed at all this, oh, we think in these abstract terms about fitness landscapes and reproducibility and how do you evolve from point A to point B. And he went into the lab and he just did it. Uh, so this is Dan Weinreich in two paper from 2006, where he took a, uh, took a protein, beta-lactamase, whatever, that conveys, confers antibiotic resistance, okay? So you've probably all heard about antibiotic resistance, right? 
as a general, you know, we as society have been eating too much antibiotics, and now if you're old and you go into hospital, the thing that is actually likely to kill you is the hospital because of the bacteria that are there, which doesn't mean I'm being recorded, so may I shouldn't be saying things like this, which doesn't mean you should not have your grandparents go or your parents go to hospitals. Hospitals are very good uh, and all that. But antibiotic resistance is a problem, and especially for the elderly and very young, so people are very, very interested in this. Okay, so the, but essentially it doesn't matter for what's going to happen. So they start, so what they knew about this protein is that if it gets five mutations, so this is the fifth mutation over here, it's going to be very resistant to antibiotics. And if it doesn't have any mutations, then it gets killed by antibiotics. Antibiotics is measured in terms of something called MIC, which is called the minimum inhibitory concentration, which is essentially the lowest concentration of antibiotics that uh, that prevents visible growth, so what essentially kills the bacteria, okay? So you put in different concentrations and at some point the bacteria dies and that's what this is. Just as sort of, just as sort of point of interest. So what they did is if you have point five mutations, that means you have 120 mutational trajectories to get from the beginning to the end, right? You have 120 different ways in which these five mutations could have appeared. And so they built all these 120, sorry, they didn't build the mutational trajectories, and you have two to the five, that means 32 different mutants, right? So you can have all the point mutants, that's five, then you have all the double mutants, so those that have two out of the five, and so on. Okay, so they know exactly what these five mutations are, and then they combinatorically build all possible versions of these mutants. Okay, so that's 32. And then they measure the fitness to the, to, uh, sorry, they measure the fitness, which means they measure how resistant they are to antibiotics. They put in different concentrations and they watch when they'll finally die. And here is a table for all of these mutants, so this is no mutations, one mutation, so on, and all five, and it gives you this concentration of the antibiotic at which they die, so the higher the number, the more resistant they are. And the first thing they sort of notice is that the order of mutation, well, the, the, the combinations of mutations actually matter. It's not, like, it's not an additive process. So if you have this mutation, you don't essentially get any uh, resistance, and if you have this mutation, you don't get any mutation either, but if you have both of them, you suddenly get a huge increase, okay? So you go up from this 0, 0.88, 8, which is nothing, to this, which is something. So what you're saying here are clear interactions, right? You have plus and minuses, so you think, you know, these are like spin variables. So if you think about like an icing model, you have a JIJ term. This is what this is telling you. That the effect of having the two is not the additive effect of having each one of them separately. So in evolution, this is called epistasis. Epistasis is just the word for interactions. And you see that a lot. This is sort of another example of things like that. So basically the background on which the uh, mutations happen uh, matters a lot and it also turns out the order of these mutations matter. And the way they figured this, well, the, the, what they did then is they actually used the sort of formalism that we were just looking at and uh, they said, well, I can calculate the probability of go for every trajectory, I can calculate the probability of this trajectory taking place. So they say mutations happen independently. So if I want all five mutations to happen, then I need all five of them to happen independently. It factorizes. And then they say, uh, then they make a very strong assumption. They worked in the weak mutation strong selection limit, so here. Uh, and they say, uh, well, in fact, if, it's a, if the, the, the mutation is deleterious or neutral, then the probability of it surviving is zero, okay? 
so that they basically equate this to zero uh, because they're only in they know that all of these mutations, well, okay, uh, they don't know that, but uh, so, so that's what they do and they assume that everything else is strong and they consider two models, one where there's a constant fixation rate and one where it's proportional to one uh, over the, 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 res the, the resistor it confers. And what, doing that, basically, they find if they get rid of all the trajectories where you would have something be deleterious, so that means the fitness goes down when you add that, you're left, instead of 120 trajectories, with only 18 possible trajectories, okay? So the take-home message of this is that not all of the 120 pos trajectories are possible, and the reason they're not all possible is because of this epistasis, because of these interactions. Right? So, I mean, this should be somehow ringing bells to you because if you think about the network graph, right, there's some moves that are forbidden because they would decrease your overall function, which is here fitness, so you can't go there. So that severely constrains the number of paths you can take. And in fact, if you plot the cumulative probability of the probability of the traje trajectories, uh, half, uh, if you want the, this cumulative probability to get to a half, uh, there's, uh, you, don't, you don't need many trajectories. So depending on the model, two or four trajectories uh, basically capture half of the total probability. So they, they take up most of the space. So there's really, you can take this down even from 18 to essentially two most likely trajectories. So. Okay, so this is plotted on this path, where, on this graph, where the yellow line is the most likely trajectory, and uh, it's, you know, and these are all the 18 ones. But basically, the first and the second most likely trajectories take up most of the probability uh, space of all trajectories. So when we think about this, I started off with telling you that evolution is the most random of all processes, right? Because all mutations, it's random whether they arise and, and so on. But it turns out that if you're actually evolving something specific, the number of ways of getting there is much more limited than you would have initially thought. We got down from 120 to essentially two possible paths. Okay? Now, how are we doing on break time? I still have some time. Uh, okay, so let, let me continue with telling. So just, there's another way of, this is another antibiotic resistant experiment from 2015 where they built something called the Morbidostat, okay? Which is basically a bacterial killing machine. Uh, so, as I, you know, as, as in the previous experiment we saw, we have these bacteria and if we give them, and if we give them more concentration of antibiotic, uh, you know, it, so there's some concentration of, an, of, of antibiotic at which they'll die. So these people said, well, we don't want them to die. We want them to constantly be on the edge. And so we're going to put in some concentration of antibiotics and then let them evolve resistance in this, and if they manage, then we'll pump it up and give them more, okay? So the bacteria are constantly pressured to uh, find new solutions. And so they did this for three types of bacteria, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the bacteria do very well in this experiment. They do manage to find new and new solutions. And this is, you know, in a way what's happening in, in our world, right? We, we've been giving ourselves more antibiotics and we've, our bacteria have been finding new solutions. But I won't go into all these details of these uh, graphs, but what you actually see here is when they do replicates and then they sequence the final population, uh, these bacteria in different replicates find very similar solutions. So again, there's some notion of reproducibility. Okay, so they, uh, these are, the way to read this is these are four replicates as uh, one-fourth of the pie chart, 
And so this is time. And as time goes on, you see which fraction of the bacteria have found the same solution at the gene level. Okay, they don't find exactly the same mutation, but they say find the same phenotypic solution. And you see that many of them, in many cases, they find solutions. So these are different kind of uh, bacteria. So it is, it, and, and you see that the fitness goes up, so they keep on finding things. Okay, so this is for the next part. Um, so before the break, let's do one simple estimate, and then we can... Uh, then we can take a break. Okay. So this 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 is supposed to the, the, you know this is supposed to be a sort of crazy estimate time, and the question is how many cell divisions have there been from the beginning of life? Okay, this is, I'm sure I'm kicking you way out of your comfort zone because you're mostly theoretical physicists, which means you like to solve equations and you don't like to do estimates because estimates are kind of bullshitty, right? So that's what we're going to do, okay? Beginning of life. When did life begin? Who knows? On this planet. Yeah, life, any life. Any ideas? A yes, a billion, 3.5 billion years, but essentially 10 to the 9 years ago. Okay, well done. Your, your, your checks in the mail. Uh, okay, so then the next thing we, so this is how, you know, when life began. Okay, so how many cell divisions per year? So, okay, so le le let's think about E. coli because that's the only thing we can think about. Uh, so E. coli in the lab, in the wild, this is of course not true and we don't really know, but it divides about twice per hour, okay? So two times per hour, means 48 times per day, which means 48 times, well, 48 times 365 days, which is of the order of 10 to the 4th per year, okay? If this, you know, this, this is what you get from multiplying these numbers. If you say this is about 10 and this is about 10 to the 3, you get that. Or if you say this is 10 squared and this is 10 squared, you get that. But if you actually multiply these numbers, you get something that's close to 10 to the 4. Not that it matters for this level of bullshitty estimate that we, we're doing. So we have 10 to the 9 years times 10 to the 4 divisions per year which gives us 10 to the 13 divisions since life began. Okay, well, sorry, these are just the number of divisions for one, one lineage. So now we have to multiply this by the number of organisms we have on Earth. Any ideas? Ten million. million. Yeah. Give me, it's a log question. I'll help you there. I don't know the name of this number, if this is a hint. Okay. <laughs> up, up. 35. Is that what you said? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a very good estimate. You said, you, you said 25. It, okay. So, you're, you're roughly in the ballpark. People estimate 10 to the 30, okay? We can do, we can do an estimate to where, where the, you know, this is obviously a completely bullshit number. Let's agree on that, right? 
Uh, I mean, okay, you can count the number of, in principle, you could try to do this, and I think they have done it in a, in a better, you know, in some sort of sensible way. But one way, I'll give you a way where you can sort of get, as I said, it's a log question. So whether you say 25 or 35, it doesn't matter really, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, of course. Yeah, no, you're, it's, no, no, you should be integrating an exponential probably. Okay, I, as I said, let's, okay, let, let me, if you, mo let, I'll get back to, so uh, let me tell you how you can estimate this number in a fast way. Uh, so, because it'll give you fun numbers. Uh, so let's say, let's, let's think about bacteria, okay? Because bacteria make up essentially 98% of, say, marine life. So anyway, we all agree there's more bacteria in the world than mammals or vertebrates, right? No, no question about that. Okay, so bacteria rule. Okay, so, so where do we find bacteria? We find them in our gut. So how many bacteria do you have in your gut right now after a few wonderful days of cafeteria food in Trieste? Again, but you said billion? Very close, yeah. About a billion, 10 billion. 10 to the 10th, okay? Okay, how many people on earth? This one you should know. Or oh, you really have to go to that sustainability session. <laughs> it's one million, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so again, we're in the same ballpark. So that gives us already 10 to the 20 bacteria. And then I'll give you a number that you probably have no, um, no idea of. I mean, yes, you can estimate it from some weird ways or you could also do this estimate using like how many bacteria are there in one liter of ocean water and stuff like that but then you have to know that and uh, that's not a number okay so it turns out that uh, humans account for 10 to the minus 4 percent of uh, non-marine biomass so 10 to the minus 4% is 10 to the minus 6 in fractions. Okay, so if we multiply these two numbers, uh, or actually you divide by that, you get 10, well, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7, whatever. 10 to the 27 uh, bacteria. Okay, so as I said, order of magnitude, it's quite close. But we get of the order of 10 to the 30 organisms, modulo the problems of things expanding, then de you know, de expanding and so on. I'm just going to multiply 10 to the 30 by 10 to the 14, which is the number of cell divisions. And this will give us approximately 10 to the 43 cell divisions. since life began, okay? Apparently, a more clever estimate gives you 10 to the 46. As I said, completely doesn't matter. I don't believe either one of these numbers. But it just gives you an order of estimate, right? So if you were to sort of say from the top of your head, it's like 10 to the 50 cell divisions from, since life began, 10 to the 40, 10 to the 50. But now the question is, what if that number was 10 to 100 cell divisions? Okay, what if it was, you know, power square of that number? Okay, would we look different? Would life look different? Sure. I mean, the, you know. So that's, that's your, your thinking exactly along the right ways. I mean, the honest answer, again, is we have no idea, right? 
but the the problem is that we don't have and we don't have an idea because you know we haven't mastered partly because we haven't mastered the theory of evolution well enough. So one thing I can tell you, so think back to the Lensky experiment yesterday. So Lensky's, Lensky's experiment has been going on for 60,000 generations, okay? Uh, at around generation 30,000, Lensky bacteria, E. coli, learned to utilize citrate, which is a food source, uh, and this means nothing to you, but I'll tell you that the definition of E. coli as a species is that E. coli are defined as a bacteria that cannot utilize citrate. So generation 30,000, one strain from the 12 strains of the Lensky experiment learns to utilize this thing that they are by the name forbidden to do. And so they form a new species, right? If we believe in bacterial species. Okay, so they've done something funky. It's like, I don't know, us growing a trunk and suddenly being able to take a shower by ourselves, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, but then the question is, should we be surprised? How do we gauge the element of surprise? Okay, that's, and in a sense, that's what statistical physics is about, right? We estimate surprise. We calculate probabilities. That gives us a concrete estimate of surprise. So on one hand, you're going to say, yes, I'm surprised because these bacteria, we gave them a name that says they cannot do this, so how dare they learn to, you know, they've really done something out of the way. But on the other hand, you can ask the other question. It was one in 12 lines of experiments. Why didn't more of them do it? So should we be surprised that only one, or should we be surprised that even one? Right? And again, we, I'm not going to answer this question for you, because we kind of stuck at the theory. But uh, that's, you know, that's what we'd like. We at least, you know, forget about the question of whether we would look different and so on, but we would at least like to know whether we should be surprised by this one line of Lensky. I mean, I, I think that's an achievable goal in our lifetime. Okay? So with that, let's take a break and um, come back. It's, it's a JCON mat, and I don't remember whether it's 2011, 2012, something like that, okay? So it's, it's like, because if you look into a biology textbook, you're going to have way too much details. You don't, probably don't want to do that. There are textbooks, there's the physical biology of the cell by Rob Phillips and... Uh, collaborators, uh, but it's most, it's more, the, the, the physics is easy most of the time, and you, it's, it's, a, it's this thick, okay, so you're not going to just read it, and it has a lot of, most of the things we haven't talked about, but again, reading maybe an introduction to a relevant chapter may help you, and then there's biophysics by Bill Bialik. Uh, which is some of the things you'll hear here may you may find there. I don't even know some of the things you'll hear from Thierry you may find there. But again, it's this thick. Uh, this one is actually aimed at physicists. It has a lot of information. Okay, but uh, I'm I have a feeling those are not the textbooks you're looking for. So I would sort of recommend. Uh, checking out Wikipedia, seriously, for like a basic idea of the biology quickly. Uh, okay, so now we're going to talk about the rate of adaptation. So organisms evolve and they evolve through this mutation, selection, and the question is how fast will a population evolve? So that basically means what is the speed with which the fitness changes? Uh, and we're going to think about the constant environment similar to Lensky. 
Uh, there's another question of how similar will these mutations be, which I've sort of been telling you that in fact they may be more similar than you expect, although, you know, on one hand they're similar, on the other hand they're not, because these lengths constraints do different things. So, okay, but so we'll, we'll talk about uh, that. Um, so maybe another, so we've already said deleterious mutations can fix, right? Another question uh, which you have not seen the answer to this one. So this is really a question uh, which is very non-intuitive, but I can ask you the question, if you increase the size of a population, will more or less deleterious mutations fix? Okay, so you have your, say, 10 to the 5th pop bacteria, now you make it 10 to the 7th. And the, will more or less of the bad guys fix? Less, more, I hear both. Who says more? Yes, okay, somebody says more. So the answer is more. But it's completely non-intuitive. Uh, you, you know, the intuition should be go that less will fix because it's harder for them to sweep through the whole population. But I, in fact, more will fix because they hitchhike with the good guys. So you're still going to get more beneficial ones, and the deleterious one is going to be next to the good one, and it's just really going to hitchhike, right? It's going to go along with whatever happens to the good guy. But it's completely not obvious, and, but this thing you can actually get out of, of formalism. Okay, so we're going to consider something like the Lenski experiment, constant population size, a mutation rate, U, uh, as each, we're gonna say that each mutation is beneficial, So we're going to make things simple, and that they have a selection coefficient s. We're not going to talk about recombination, as I said, completely unrealistic there. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to consider the case, case where mutations are rare. Okay? So that's... That's the same limit that we worked out the fixation probabilities. And we're going to ask uh, how often does, the first question is how often does a mutation occur in any individual or in some individual, in any individual, right? In, in some individual. Okay, I'll add the other population size n. So you have n individuals and uh, you have a mutation rate. How often does a mutation occur? Yeah, n times u, okay? So the time that you have to wait for one mutation is 1 over n u. Okay, so for 1 over new time, nothing happens. So then, they, uh, so then it occurs, and most of them, of course, quickly go extinct due to genetic drift, but what is a probability that a mutation actually survives genetic drift. So, uh, so we, we can say that if it survives muta in genetic drift, it establishes. So just for simplicity, for the estimate, let's say that it fixes. What's the probability that a mutation fixed in this limit from the first part of the lecture today? S, right? Strong selection, weak mutation. Strong beneficial selection. Remember that result, S, that I underlined and said is important? Okay. <laughs> now you know why. It's important for other reasons, but... Okay. So, after 1 over N U S, well, you know, we have these ones here that go extinct, but we'll have one here that will go above 1. And then it will drift again some more. Sorry, I don't want to. And it will become larger than 1 over s. 
um, after after some time. And after this time, it'll grow deterministically. Okay, so. Uh, how long it will, so, and then after some time, it'll, so it will grow deterministically, and it then it'll fix some max value of that it'll find, or essentially it will fix. So can we calculate now this deterministic time? Okay. So, okay, so the, so deterministically, when it grows, how does it grow? Exponentially, thank you. So that means that the population, the number of these back mutants, which started off as 1 over s, then it increases exponentially with a coefficient s, and we want to ask what is the time after which they'll take over the whole population, right, which is n. So we can solve this equation and get that this time deterministic time is 1 over s log ns. So that's one picture. This is the picture for rare mutations. So the next question is, uh, when does this whole picture break down? Exactly, when the mutation is not rare. And so what does it mean that the mutation is not rare? Right? So look, okay, I didn't draw this perfectly. When the mutation is rare, it means that the time for a mutation to actually appear and come up to here is much longer than this time it takes for it to fix. Right? Because it rare means that this happens very rarely and then this is deterministic, so it'll go. Okay, so that means that this time is much longer than this time. That means that 1 over n u s is much larger than 1 over s log n s. S cancel, and we get that this means that n over u is 1 log n o. This is what rare mutation means. Okay, so so maybe first let's see how possible this is for this to break down. Okay, so now we know you have the ten a billion uh, E. coli in your gut. Uh, and so let's say n is of order of 10 uh, of a billion. And let's say they divide more rarely than in the lab. So let's say they divide 20 times a day. Um, does that, uh, this does actually doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, so, and the genetic mutation rate of E. coli, so you overall is about 10 to the minus 3 per genome if you're being conservative. But not all of those mutations are beneficial. In fact, about 1 in 10,000 mutations are beneficial. So if you want the U of beneficial mutations, which is what you want, then you have to divide 10 to the minus 3 by 10 to 1, 2, 3, 4. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So you get 10 to the minus 7. Um, and if you multiply that now, uh, by n, so n u is, well, okay, seven, yeah, 
So let's say this is 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. This is 10 to 100. OK. Uh, selection coefficients are about 0.1 to 0.01. And so this gives us an NS of about 10 to the 6. So 1 over log 10 to the 6 is 10 to the minus 2. OK. So what we're comparing here is a new, which we got to be 10 to 100, to be much less than 10 to the minus 2, OK? So that's clearly not true. So this is even being conservative. Uh, what we get is that for typical numbers that we have in bacteria, mutations are really not rare. Which, in a way, we've also seen from those experiments. That's why we see those clonal interference patterns, OK? Which sort of, yeah? Probably I missed something from the, uh, yesterday lecture, but uh, biologically, what do we mean when we say beneficial mutation and deleterious mutation? That's a very good question. In general, what we mean is a mutation that will uh, increase the growth rate of an organism. But as you saw in the example earlier today, it depends on the context. So there can be mutation happening in a specific position that if it happens in a given background, it's good and it'll increase the growth rate of the bacteria, of the organism. But if it happens in another background, it'll be bad. It, so, so I give it the same, exactly the same mutation. So the same going from A to G in one context can be good and in another can be bad. So beneficial and deleterious. On top of that, that's even in the same environment. Now, reality happens in fluctuating environments, so in different environments, right? The environment we find ourselves in is constantly changing. So something that's good in one environment can be bad in another. So, I mean, just as a simple uh, thing, you know, imagine you find yourself in, a, in an environment where there's tons of one food source. So if you develop the ability to use that food source, that's good. But then you finally find yourself in an environment where that food source doesn't exist at all. And now you're really specialized in using this one food source. In fact, that mutation you got, which may said, I can only eat this, like I can only you know, eat milk, and then you find yourself in rural China, you're, you're not going to be doing very well, right? In an environment where there is no milk. OK, okay? so this is. This we have to study the design. Yeah, and very. So that's what people are doing now. And how much time can it take to study the That's a, these are, you know, the question of how, do, how does a changing environment influence evolution? This is, I'll, I'll show you an experiment in a second, but it's also theoretically that's what we're doing. <laughs> Many other people are doing, you know, there's questions of matching of time scales of the environment to evolution. All of those questions are out there. So these are, you know, this is part of why we don't understand anything. But these are all very good questions. And this is also why the answer to, you know, in, in simple terms, deleterious means bad and <laughs> beneficial means good. But what is good and bad really depends both on the genomic context and on the environment, on everything. So it's a phenotypic definition. It's an effective definition. OK. So, yeah. No, sorry, this, this says mutations are rare. We're first doing the limit of mutations are rare. This is the number, this is N of T. N of T is the number of bacteria or whatever, of, it's the number of organisms. As a Because you've survived genetic drift, right? So you've, you, your population size has grown enough that you're less susceptible 
to the fluctuations coming from small numbers. An estimate? If before there is uh, error mutation and you uh, match less than yeah. one so, okay. definition. No, this is, yes, well, the, the, not the definition. Wait, so, okay, the philosophy of this is I did an estimate for the time scales for what happens assuming mutations are rare, okay? Then I asked the question, what does it mean for mutations to be rare? Right? How do I define the limit of rare mutations? And I, based on these estimates, a mutation is rare if the time, this determinist, whatever happens deterministically, is much smaller than for a new mutation to happen. Okay? I think it'll become, uh, so now I'll ask the question of what, is, what happens when mutations are not rare. So what happens biologically? Here we had a situation where one mutation appeared and it was left alone until it fixed and took over the whole population. Now if mutations are not rare, what will happen? Yeah, so what will happen is basically before I manage to fix this one, a new mutation will appear, right? So I'll have many mutations at the same time. So if this is not true, I will have many mutations, and that's what we've been seeing on, on these pictures where we see these different colors, right? A mutation appears here, but before it manages to sweep, this one appears, and this one, and this one. So there's new mutations coming in all the time. So we're gonna have many lineages. Right? A new mutation forms a lineage and the lineages are going to come in and they're going to interfere with each other. That's why it's called clonal interference because a clone is a lineage, essentially. Okay, so that's what we're going to work out now. Uh, okay, so before maybe we work out that out now, we can still ask a question about this limit, about what is actually the speed of... Uh, in the rare mutation limit, so what happens? So if we think about this picture a bit differently now, if we think about the fitness instead of thinking about time, I started off with what I'll define the initial individual that had zero fitness. This is the fraction of the population. And I got a mutation and I started a new lineage that has a fitness of one, right? It has, it has one mutation, so in terms of mutations, it's higher in mutations by one, and it's better, so what will happen is this one will grow and this one will decrease, right? This one is better, so it will overtake that one as time goes on. So at a later time, my graph will look like I drew with the green one. Okay, and so what the speed of adaptation is, is how quickly you, you change from this picture to that picture. Okay, so what is the speed? So to calculate the speed, you have to calculate the rate of new mutations establishing, so that we've already determined, right? This is the rate at which they overcome drift, and once they establish, the population grows with rate S. It's growth rate or selective advantage. Okay, so that means that the speed of adaptation is n u s squared. I'll write it down here in case I uh, delete other things. So in the rare mutation, okay. Yeah. 
rate of new mutations establishing. Right? This is when they overcome drift. And this is just tie. Once they establish, right, they grow with this rate because this is their selective advantage. So the overall speed of going from this picture to that picture is given by that. It's on average, right? Okay, I should also say, for those of you with a, a mathematical inclination or maybe a rigorous inclination, what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm doing back-of-the-envelope calculations. There is a rigorous calculation. There's rigorous calculations to do here based on generating functions, and uh, they're very beautiful calculations, but we just don't have time for them, and I want to get to a result. If you're interested, I can send you, I can, I can point you uh, to the sources, but I am, I am waving my hands, and I am waving my hands because I have the power of the rigorous calculation behind me, so I know what the answer should be, okay? Okay, so now let's go to the non-rare regime. So if we look at that same picture now, we start off with zero mutations. We start off with zero mutations. And then a first mutation establishes, so same thing. It starts off small, but it starts to grow because it's better, right? So it starts to grow, whereas this starts to decrease. But as it grows, mutations are no longer rare, so a second mutation will come about, right? And this grows even faster than this one. So it grows, 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 but before it and this one, you know, keeps on decreasing now. And before this one gets very far, a third one comes about, right? That's what means mutations are not rare. They keep on happening all the time. So at the end of the day, and this one keeps, so at the end, you know, so this one will, well, this one will grow even more. So it'll, uh, this, but at the end of the day, this one will have shrunk. This will, you know, you get some sort of picture like this and the fourth one and so on. So essentially, whoops, I lost my chalk. You will get something That looks like this. Okay? Because the ones at the top grow the most quickly, the ones here shrink the most quickly, and all of these grow slightly less than the average. The arrow should be symmetric, but you, you get the idea, right? So if you're in the mean, we can now renormalize and call this zero fitness. And then there's the ones that are better than the mean and the ones that are worse with the mean. Okay? You intuitively see that this happens, right? And so you get this distribution, which actually you can work out from mutation selection balance in the probabilistic set, and it's roughly a Gaussian. But the other thing you may notice that happens is that this never stops. That this is a wave that will move like that, because there'll always be a fitter mutation. So we're assuming there'll always be a fitter mutation. And there'll be a wave that travels through this fitness picture, okay? So you, you're going to get this traveling wave. You're always translating to higher Okay. 
make this longer. And this is what we can now calculate, the speed with which the, uh, the wave moves. So maybe one control ha question, what happens if this population size will increase? What happens to this wave, to the Gaussian? Yeah. Okay. So you start, you know, you establish these things that are more and more fit, and the fitter they are, the more they grow. That's the definition of them being more fit, okay? So, but the fitter they grow, since we have constant population size, that means the faster these ones have to die. And if you, it happens with time, then you'll find yourself with this mean of the, the most individuals are in the mean of the distribution. There's the head of the distribution where you get the new ones that are very fit, but they just came about not too long ago, so they haven't had time to grow. And the, long, the more they are in this direction, the older they are, so the more time they've had to grow, but the slower they grow. So this is the, yeah, this is fitness, and this is the fraction of population. So you'll find that most of the population is, well, in, 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 in not very fit, but not very bad. Because then there's the ones that are very bad, which are the ones that were here a very long time ago, and eventually they go extinct. Okay, so you get this shape, and I'm not proving to you it's a Gaussian, but you can... You know, it depends on whether for beneficial mutations. Uh, yeah, I mean, in a limit, it's a Gaussian. It's more like a Poisson, actually. Okay, but you can you can do the calculation. You can work out exactly what this distribution is. But it looks it looks like a you know little Gaussian envelope. That the important thing is it always it will continue moving there because we're making the assumption that there's no ceiling. There's no optimal solution. You can always get better, so it will continue moving, and if the, since it's the mutations that make it move, the rate of mutations are constant, so it will move on average at a constant rate. So, let's say there is actually a limit. In this case, uh, relative theory is the maximum fitness. So the only mutation that can happen are actually relative to fitness. So in that sense, you should also have a scenario where the mean starts <coughs> moving the other way. Yeah, but there, there's a different calculation. You can do the same. So in, if all the, the mutations are deleterious, then yeah, then, then you have something like that. It's called Mueller's ratchet, and you have the same, same thing. So actually, the, the, you can build the formulas that people have with both beneficial and deleterious. And the, 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 okay. Right, so now if the population size will increase, right, uh, so w what happens to the distribution? Wider. It gets wider, exactly, because it'll take more time for you to kill the bad guys. And okay, what if you increase the mutation rate? Same thing, right? Also gets wider because now you're going to be producing more and more of them. Uh, more quickly. Okay, so question, what is the speed of this wave in 15 minutes? So we're going to break this up into two regimes. Uh, we're going to break it up into two regimes. So the first thing we're going to notice we're going to call the fittest class Q, okay? So we're going to call this distance Q. And uh, we're going to first assume we know what Q is, and then we're going to calculate it self-consistently. But we're going to notice two things, that there's, in fact, two regimes to this distribution. There's the bulk, where there's a lot of individuals, and we can trade the bulk bulk deterministically, because there's no stochastic effects here, right? Everything's been around for a while, everybody's there probably in fairly large numbers. Uh, however, there's a lot of non-linearity here, because there's very, I drew it like this, but in fact there's very many lineages 
all the individuals here are not the same, right? Because they came from some different ancestor. So there's many lineages interacting with each other and competing. So there's high nonlinearity, but no stochasticity. And then we have the head where there's a lot of stochasticity because they have very small numbers. They ju just arose, but there's no nonlinearity because we're probably dealing with one lineage. So we're going to treat these two different uh, regimes differently and we're gonna we're gonna couple them okay so this is q so then this will have an advantage of qs uh, the head of the distribution now um okay so let's assume we know q for now uh, and let's calculate uh, the so the number of individuals in the nose so in this head of the distribution at time t is just like the previous time, deterministically, given that they've established they have a fitness e to the qs, and then they grow with rate e to the qst. Okay? Uh, so the question is, how long does it take for an even fitter individual, so one that has q1 plus s to uh, arrive and so we know the answer to that because it's the same thing as we did before it's the mutation rate times the number of individuals uh, times the probability that they establish okay so that that they grow to a certain length and uh, we can ask okay how long uh, for new fitness class to establish? And we're going to do, right, so we're going to ask how long if they, this is the probability of them appearing, um, dt. How long before they reach a significant number? And we're going to say that the significant number is one. It can be five if you want. It really doesn't matter, right? It's just order of magnitude. Do like that. So we plug in the result for the nose. And so we have zero to tau. The QS cancels. E to the QST dt equals one which is e u to the q s e to the q s tau minus one is equal to one. If q s tau is probably larger than one for any reasonable value of q, so I can assume this is smaller. If it's e q s tau is larger than one. And so tau equals one over q s logarithm of q s u. Okay, so this is the time for a new fitness class to establish. I'm going to mark this with a dot. Okay, and so every tau steps, we're going to get yet a new fitter one. This is a separate thing. Just okay. Now, let's try and calculate Q from the fact that the mean also changes, right? Because as this wave travels, uh, the mean it also changes. So after Q, so uh, okay, after Q of these tau's, this will become the mean. Right, because we will have clicked Q times, and what is here will now uh, come here. So on average, if you're growing at a rate he zero here and a rate Q here, and it takes you tau times Q to get from here to here, on average you're growing at a rate of Q tau in the time of Q tau over two. Sorry, uh, Q sorry, QS over two. Uh, 
f f during this time, you're, you go from being here, from being at the nose to being at the middle. So we're going to demand that every time the nose increases by one, the mean has to increase by one, so that the wave is really traveling symmetrically. And we're going to say, well, if I start with one over QS individuals, uh, just as I do in, in the nose, after Q, S, T, and I'm on average growing with this rate as time goes on, so I'm averaging over the growth rate in the bulk, how long, what's the time I need for me to uh, get to here, where essentially I take up most of the population, right? This is the bulk, so I take up nearly all of the population, okay? Of course, I take on really n minus the wing, the integral of the wings, but the majority uh, of the population is still there. Okay, so this time, so we can say, I'll write it out for you, time to go from nose to the mean, Okay, so this is just from solving this equation. Yeah? Why are we writing minus radical? Like QS minus radical? Yeah, because we're saying I want to estimate a rough time it takes me to get from being the best to being average. Okay? Like you start a new trend, you're cool, and then everybody else is doing it, right? This is the time it takes for you to stop being cool. On average, you're growing in all of this. Uh, I mean, your growth rate here is Q. Here is Q minus what? Q. Sorry, your growth rate here is Q times S, right? Your advantage is the number of mutations you have. Here, if you're here, then it's Q minus 1S, Q minus 2S, Q minus 3S, and so on. So over this time, on average, you're growing with a rate of QS over 2 because here it's zero. So assuming that that's your growth rate on average, and you started off with one over QS individuals, how long does it take you to basically dominate the population? And if you solve it, then you solve for T, and you get that. And this, by definition, is Q tau. Yes. Okay, it's a bad estimate. As I said, I agree this should be n minus integral of the distino. Okay? But if it's a peak distribution, it's not that bad of an approximation. Look, I, as I said, I'm doing this because I know it'll come out roughly okay. Uh, but I, no, I agree with you. It's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a strong approximation, okay? But you're getting, you'll see, you'll see why it's not so bad of an approximation. You're going from zero to some Q and it has to fall off. Once you see what Q is, maybe you'll feel a bit more comfortable. Okay, but first we have to calculate it. But it's a self-consistent argument. So if it was a bad approximation, then I would have to go back and I would have to add this. And maybe I would have to worry about whether I haven't cheated too much here. And there's many points like that. So that's, uh, but you know, there, there's a hardcore calculation of this. Okay, so this, by definition of tau, has to be equal to Q times tau, the tau because we define the ta tau as how long a new fitness class establishes. Okay, so the time that we've lost our 
superiority somebody else has established as a new fitness class. Okay, so then we want, so this is another estimate for tau. Well, I'll, I'll write it out explicitly. This gives us a new estimate for tau, which is 1 over 2 qs log nqs. And then we want these two to agree. And from having these two estimates for tau agree, we can, we can calculate q. Okay, and so from that, I get Q equal to, well, why don't I go up there again? Q equal to 2 log NQS over N. Okay. Um, so this gives us a solution for Q. Uh, so this is, okay, so this is where the tip of the distribution is. So, okay, the only thing is that you see this is an implicit equation for Q. So how do we solve these kinds of equations? Graphically is one answer, right? Uh, and there's another way we can solve them, which is even more brute, brute force, and you're going to like even less. But we can make approximations, right? We can do it recursively. So recursively means that we ignore the Q, uh, since Q depends logarithmically here and linearly here, as a first approximation, we ignore the logarithmic dependence. Sorry, I, I messed up, didn't I? Uh, no, no, it's okay. It's okay, S over U. So to, in, at zero of order, we, uh, we ignore the Q dependence and uh, we get that. And then at first order, we take this solution for Q here and plug it in here and then get a first order solution for Q and so on, right? And we can do this until it starts to converge. But let's stop at zero of order. It'll turn out it's already pretty good compared to doing the full calculation. And if we look at the in-lab E. coli population of n to the six with S to 10 to the minus two and U 10 to the minus four, that gives us a Q of 2 log 10 to the 4 of log 10 squared, which is 4. And uh, I don't actually know if I have it, but 4 is a pretty good estimate for what goes on in, in the yeast uh, in the lab. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to go a little bit over but then I finish and then we can stop with this and not get back to it. So that gives me Q. So then I can calculate the speed which is just the rate of the growth divided by tau, right? Which is the rate at which uh, this whole thing moves. And so I can take tau from either one of these uh, so I can take it from here, but let me make the same approximation I made over there to get rid of the logarithmic dependence in Q and plug in, uh, sorry, uh, I have a, yeah, so I have a Q here uh, and a Q here, so I'm going to get rid of the logarithmic dependence because I'm going to plug in my Q from over there without the logarithmic dependence. So I get 1 to s log 
as overu log ns. Um, and if I do this, so I have 1 over tau, so I have 1, 2, s squared logarithm of ns logarithm squared s of And as I said, this turns out to be roughly right. And now the punchline of all of this. So if we plot the, velo the speed of adaptation as a function of the population size, for rare mutations, it's linear in N, right? So these are rare. But for the interfering mutations, for the non rare mutations, it's logarithmic in N. Okay? So it's much, small, it's much smaller. And if you do this correctly, it goes up a bit. If you include, um, yeah. So, But essentially, it still goes as, as the log of n. So what that means is that if you want to adapt quickly, you're actually better off having rare mutations than having non-rare mutations, right? And this is like the log of n, and this is like n. So the question is, how can you do better than this if you're a bacteria? And you do have many mutations. So you're forced to be in the non-rare regime. Is there something you can do? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they can use that uh, like horizontal regime. Exactly. You can recombine. OK, the answer is recombination. In fact, recombination doesn't get you as far as here. It does do slightly better but it definitely does in speed increase your speed. And so this is one of the reasons that people give for the emergence of recombination or sexual reproduction, because it increases your speed of adaptation. Okay. Yes? Yeah. So what if you have a distribution? Okay, even if you have different, uh, let's say, some mutations that are taken into account, they are still the same rate of mutation. Yeah. You can do this with a distribution. I mean, it's not as easy, but once, once you go to this generating function framework that's behind all of this, you can do that. You can put in a distribution of mutation rates. The general conclusion doesn't change. Okay? And if you find this call, and if you find these fitness waves cool, you can work out what is the speed of this, you, what, what is the, I mean, you basically can write down an equation like a diffusion equation that we've been writing down and show explicitly that this is a traveling wave in the sense of a traveling wave. So X minus VT and work out what is V and so on. So if you like that kind of thing, you can go ahead. But uh, it's like a whole different set of 20-hour uh, lecture to do all this. So we won't do it. Okay, so I'll see you after lunch.